when Hal Shelburne saw it, when his son Dennis pulled it out of a moldering Ralston Purina carton that had been pushed far back under one attic eave, such a feeling of horror and dismay rose in him that for one moment he thought he surely must scream. He put one fist to his mouth as if to cram it back, and then merely coughed into his fist. Neither Terry nor Dennis noticed, but Petey looked around, momentarily curious. Hey, neat, Dennis said respectfully. It was a tone Hal rarely got from the boy anymore himself. Dennis was twelve. What is it? Petey asked. He glanced at his father again before his eyes were dragged back to the thing his big brother had found. What is it, Daddy? It's a monkey, fart brains, Dennis said. Haven't you ever seen a monkey before? Don't call your brother fart brains, Terry said automatically, and began to examine a box of curtains. The curtains were slimy with mildew, and she dropped them quickly. Ugh. Can I have it, Daddy? Petey asked. He was nine. What do you mean? Dennis cried. I found it. Boys, please, Terry said. I'm getting a headache. Hal barely heard them, any of them. The monkey glimmered up at him from his older son's hands, grinning its old familiar grin. The same grin that had haunted his nightmares as a child, haunted them until he had... Outside a cold gust of wind rose and for a moment lips with no flesh blew a long note through the old rusty gutter outside. Petey stepped closer to his father, eyes moving uneasily to the rough attic roof through which nail heads poked. What was that, Daddy? he asked, as the whistle died to a guttural buzz. Just the wind, Hal said. Better watch out, baby, who's that? Don't look now, there's a monkey on your back. Watch out, baby, who's that? Don't look now, there's a monkey on your back. The monkey. It's called Monkey on Your Back. It was by George Michael. Yeah. Why can't you do it? Why can't you set your monkey free? Is it? What is it? What? It's about a monkey on your back. It's. I think it's about addiction. But well, yeah. <laughs> but in a way, it's relevant to our story today, because this is about a guy who can't get rid of his monkey. Except this monkey is a is real murder. Monkey. Is. <laughs> <laughs> that if the okay, if they had made an actual factual movie based on this, that would be a great tagline. This monkey <laughs> dot 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 is murder <laughs> exclamation point. <laughs> and unfortunately, the movie poster for this could not be what you would want it to be, which is just a shot of the monkey with the symbols on a black background because that was already stolen for the movie Monkey Shines, <laughs> which is not based on this story, but is instead based on the novel Monkey Shines and is not about a symbol banging monkey. It's about an actual rhesus monkey. False advertising. I'm angry about it. I'm angry about it. Have you ever seen Monkey Shines? No. Really? Oh, my goodness. I'm surprised. <laughs> I'm not, are, are you? No. <laughs> I'm not surprised at all. It's actually a pretty good movie, but it's about a, a guy who gets who's paralyzed and he gets a rhesus monkey as like a companion monkey but he doesn't some, somehow he's accidentally gotten a rhesus monkey that's like escaped from a lab so it's uh it's like hyper intelligent and as all smart things are evil so yeah monkey shines it tries to kill him it gets jealous of his girlfriend and tries to and tries to kill her tries to control his life monkey shines monkey shines oh by the way i'm phil and I'm Willow. And it's, it's Del, Del Toro, Toro time. time. But we're not talking about Guillermo del Toro. Why? Because we're reading a short story. Uh, and is this in a collection of short stories? Perhaps, perhaps? It is. What, what collection? The Dark Descent. By? David G. Hartwell. And this section is called... Uh, the Medusa Med and the Shield. Right. And it's about what? Monkeys. Psychological terror. <laughs> Psychological monkeys. Monkey terror... Is the okay? Well, we'll get to it. Uh, <laughs> hi, everyone. Hi. The reason that we're doing this, in case you just joined us, because it's because watching movies got hard again for no reason, uh, mostly because of internet connections, I think. And mm -hmm. we started. We we covered the first third of the Dark Descent, uh, the Color of Evil, and now we're back covering the second part of this. And we're both smart people who like to read stories. Yeah. And they're sp um, spooky. Yeah, and, you know, 
It's our podcast. You can do it. Yeah, we, we can do whatever the heck we want. <laughs> uh, Guillermo del Toro only makes so many movies a, a, a year. And uh, for some reason, we just were having trouble watching Defending Your Life. So Yeah. Um, so this, we finally got it. This is our second Stephen King. The first one was the first story. The first story. story the thing. It was the La Lake story. Yeah. The Reach. <laughs> which was... M- Kind of, I think, more psychological than... The, yeah. To me, these two stories should have been swapped. Like, the first section was about, like, legitimate evil. And this section is about, like, interior horror. But to me, the, sto- the, the those concepts are the opposite in these stories. <laughs> like, this monkey's evil. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and the No reach- doubt about it. About about a what? No doubt about oh, it. Oh, no doubt about it. Uh, and the reach was more about like the interiority of this woman who was like reaching the end of her life, <laughs> <laughs> and like wasn't that scary? It was mostly sad. But in any yeah. case, the monkey, uh, written in 1980, and by the time King wrote this story, like he was successful. He had he had been having short stories published since the late 60s. Uh, by 1980, he had already published Carrie, Salem's Lot, The Shining, The Stand, uh, Dead Zone, and this is the year Firestarter came out. He'd already had Car- uh, Carrie had already been based on like the movie had come out, and he'd already had a collection of short stories. Night Shift had already been published, so he was a successful writer at this point. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's why I was a little confused that this pu- story was originally published in uh, in. Well, what's the magazine called? Um, uh, not it's not Cavalier. It was oh my god, why am I having trouble finding this? It was it's hard to it's hard to get through his list of short stories because there's so many. Uh, it was originally published in Gallery in November of 1980, and Gallery is a nudie mag uh-huh. that had aspirations of kind of being Playboy. But it's just funny that he was still he, – he only published one more short story in Gallery. He had published a lot before this. I assume it's just because maybe they gave him a good deal. Probably. <laughs> yeah, because it wasn't published within the body of the magazine. It was actually a pull-out insert mm-hmm. like, with its own glossy cover and everything. Like So you could remove the monkey from the nudie mag and read it on the subway, I guess, if you wanted to, without just reading an, a dirty magazine. Because I, I've seen Gallery in, like, like I've searched for Gallery to try to find this short story in Gallery. And it's just, it's a TNA mag. Like, it's... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's not, and it's less classy than Playboy. It's, yeah. Uh, it throws, it throws them, it throws them women right in your face. So, uh, I mean, I, I guess I was just, like, puzzled as to why in 1980 King was still publishing in adult magazines. Uh, maybe they just gave him enough money. I don't know. Uh, but the monkey... Uh, we're yeah, we're dealing with a writer who's kind of firing on all cylinders at this point. All uh, symbolers. <laughs> Go to your room. I'm in my room. Symbolers. He said that he was. <laughs> he said that he was inspired to write this story uh, because he was on this. He was. I was going to say he was on the street. He was not on the streets he was walking down the street in new york city uh and he didn't live in new york city he just he was conducting business there and there was a guy uh selling these monkeys on the street like i guess he had a setup he said there was a bunch spread out on a on a blanket on on the corner of 5th and 44th uh all bending and grinning and clapping their symbols and he said quote they looked really scary to me uh yeah i wonder why so, for those who aren't familiar with, with the, the monkey we're talking about, uh, Willow, why don't you describe to our listeners what these monkeys are like? Um, it depends. Which version are you talking about? Uh, let's say the, the most common version. The version that we see in movies and see on the book covers. Well, I mean, everyone's familiar with that version. Because yeah. everyone's seen Toy Story. <laughs> uh, everyone's seen that series. Uh, how would you... From your heart of hearts, describe this monkey toy. It will eat the devil and laugh about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, symbol banging monkeys. Uh, I mean, I hope people know 
what we're referring to when when we say simple banking monkey. If you look it up online, if you look it up on Wikipedia, Simple Banking Monkey Toy, the picture they use. Symbol banking. Uh, well, we're not banking on these symbols. <laughs> um, uh, they were originally created by the company Daishin CK. It's a Japanese toy company in, during the 1950s, and they were sold under the name Musical Jolly Chimp. Uh, as far as the description goes, it screeched and showed its teeth when its head was pressed. Uh, and... And I guess monkey uh, symbols were quickly added to to the toy, and they are they are terrifying. Yeah, they're a night they're night they're nightmarish. Yeah, if I had been given one of these in the 1950s, as if I was a Japanese child and my parents had been like, "Here you go, uh, Toshiro," I would have been like, "I'm I I guess you hate me, and I guess I'm dying tonight." Yeah. Yeah, there's a, these are ugly, horrible toys, and they capture. They're, yeah, they're bad. They capture the public imagination. Everyone started making their own symbol banging. Like I sent you a bunch of examples. Yeah, wait, what were they? What were they called? There were some good names in there. Uh, there is Charlie Chimp. Ah, yes, there is there, there is, a uh, Clockwork Musical Monkey with clashing symbols. Really rolls off the tongue. Hmm. Uh. uh Peppy tumbling a monkey with symbol. Wind up monkey playing symbols. Uh, there are two called Charlie Chimp. Charlie with an I-E and Charlie with an E-Y. Uh, yeah. And Charlie with an E-Y, Charlie Chimp. I sent you a video of Charlie Chimp working. And by working, I mean being the devil. Yep. Uh, you, I sent you a photo and you said, why are its eyes like that? Because not <laughs> only do the lips open and bare its skull-like teeth, what do the eyes do? They pop out of his set. And the eyes aren't friendly eyes. No, they're red and, and it, angry. And it turns out that when you try to replicate the look of a monkey's nose in a toy, it just looks like a skull nose. Yep. Yeah. Uh, there is no version of a symbol banging monkey toy, no matter what model they're using, that looks like anything less than either the perpetrator of evil or the victim of evil. Because some of these are, <laughs> are look cowed and ashamed of being who they are. Yep. Uh, they're nightmares. I don't understand why anyone thought this was ever cute. But as as we said... They've been ripped off like they like, for for decades. Like since they were created, these monkeys have existed, and people have have just they they've been cash cows, I guess. Yeah, I a, mean, I'm sending I... you a picture of a vintage one right now. All right, here we it's, go. It's a little worse for wear. All right, let's see what it. So, no matter what, these things look. They don't get cuter as time goes on. This thing has seen the wars. Uh, why what wars? Are the... I don't know. But... I thought that the teeth were uh, like just drawn on, but nope, they're molded directly into the plastic, as you can see from the the fact that the paint has worn off on this one. Why would you give the teeth depth? No idea. <laughs> yeah, this says this is a this is from a, a Reddit. It's a Charlie Chimp that was found in an abandoned greenhouse. <laughs> Great. Why are people have they ever read this story? You don't take abandoned chimps out of greenhouses or anywhere that you find unless you want your family to get murdered. And also, as the story, you can't abandon these. Uh, if yeah. you abandon a chimp, a, a symbol playing chimp, it is going to come back. It's going to come back and haunt you. And as the story has re relates. Uh, kill everything you love. Yep. Yeah. So and this then a is... bunch of fish. <laughs> and then a bunch of fish. So this is The Monkey by Stephen King, 1980, uh, published in 1985 in Skeleton Crew, which is probably where most people have read it, uh, and a, a billion other collections where it is always either like the first story or the last story because people know that this is the winner. Uh, one of my favorite short stories when I was a kid, I was a little hesitant about rereading it because my experience with that from, from the Clive Barker story is that they don't hold up, but I am pleasant. I am happy to announce this story holds up. This is a... This is a solid short story. Uh, but Willow, why don't you tell our listeners what this story is about? 
the story is about how not the AI from right. it was two thousand one Space Odyssey, is that what it's from? Mm-hmm. Uh is about how a guy with some kids and a wife who when he was a little boy had a murder monkey friend and then threw it away and then found it again uh, when he was older Mm -hmm. and is now trying to protect his family from it. Doing a pretty bad job at first, you know, almost beating his his son. (laughs) Uh, It's not great. Um, Now, 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 wait. Now, Hal wasn't trying to, wasn't, he didn't beat his son. He just grabbed his son and slammed him repeatedly against the wall. Yeah. Uh, This is one of our, this is, Hal belongs in the Museum of Stephen King Bad Dads. This is still Stephen King. This is 1980 Stephen King. This is this is drug and alcohol Stephen King. This is, I mean, he already wrote The Shining. This is Stephen King reflecting on the fact that he is not a good father at this point. Yeah. Um, and if this story is about nothing else, it is about Stephen King feeling terribly guilty about being a bad dad. Uh. Yeah, because Hal, yeah, Hal, is he an alcoholic in this story or just, he, no, he's out of work. He's unemployed yeah. dad. Um, yeah. Or he's gotten a new job. He was fired from his good job and they had to move. Uh, but he does slam his son, his older son, repeatedly against the wall. Uh, and and then they make up. They hug and make up. Mm-hmm. So it's. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He's a stressed man. Uh, now you said that this is a murder monkey, and this I didn't need to. Monkey. Even though the story is called the monkey, I must point out that this is a chimp, which is not a monkey. A chimp is a great ape, and I'm frustrated by the fact that it's still referred to as a monkey. Has no tail. <laughs> Has no tail. Has no tail. Um. Well, I mean, it's that's just the way it is, man. The great ape doesn't really flow off the tongue as easily. Because this ape ain't great. This ain't bad. This is the bad ape. The bad ape. Yeah. Um, this is the poor Re- ape. Rename your short story, Stephen King. The bad ape. Because, because well, you said this is a murder monkey. How does this monkey murder? Does it does it smash people to get his heads with their symbols? Does it does it show up at night and smother you with its with its clanging symbol? How does this monkey murder? Um it just sort of kills him. <laughs> Wait, will you please be a little more specific? Well, one of the people gets shot mm-hmm. in an apartment shootout, so it seems it seems like it it mostly for I am. My question looks, is: Have you read the symbols. story? I have. Yes, it slams its symbols together, and then they like they just die. Yeah, uh, some sort of monkey magic, some sort of magic. Mm-hmm. Uh, people die when the symbols crash together, but it's, it's like a banshee. Except for non lore accurate banshee, right? It, uh, it, it, its powers are referred to in TV tropes as reality warping because it, mm-hmm. it makes it's kind of like Final Destination. It makes things happen that yeah. uh, either you get hit by a car or one of its favorites seems to be having some sort of brain aneurysm or stroke. Mm-hmm. Just like, I mean, I, I imagine that's probably the easiest to to warp because brain aneurysms and strokes aren't that uncommon. And also, everyone has a brain, right? Which makes me wonder why it just doesn't do that all the time. But it also seems to be like trying to punish the the guy, like mm-hmm. make it like make it apparent that like you're the you're kind of the cause of all this. For so, this is one of my favorite kind of horror stories, which is I didn't do anything wrong. There's nothing wrong with finding a monkey, yeah. and yet I accidentally started. Some, it's basically like the Grudge, like. Mm-hmm. You just wandered into, you stumbled onto something, and now you can't escape its its malevolence, and everyone's going to die because you did this. But you're not really at fault. You were a kid who found a monkey. Yeah, it's yeah. the um, the good old Aristotle tale. What's the Aristotle tale? Oh, the story of Aristotle finding the symbol crashing monkey toy. Yeah, right, clearly, right. clearly. No, right, it's, right, just, right. it's it's his definition of what makes a good tragedy. Uh, the hero isn't someone too good or too bad. And the problems that are happening aren't really their fault, but they're happening anyways. Yeah, and that's what happens here. He, his father was a merchant marine who disappeared, 
uh, left one day and never came back. So he's a kid. This is back in when he was a kid. And he finds a bunch of he he and his brother would dig through their father's stuff, which is just like this attic filled with junk. They find the monkey. Lo and behold, if you if you start it up, well, it doesn't work, but then it does work. And when it when it, when it works, it, it works. It kills his favorite babysitter. Uh, mm-hmm. She's the one who you said died in a shootout. Yeah, uh, it kills like the family's like cat. It kills his best friend who falls out of a off a tree. It kills the dog. It it causes people to get hit by cars. It's just the worst. He, it's the worst. And he knows it's happening, but he can't stop it because if he tries to get rid of it, it always turns up like a bad penny. Sometimes mm-hmm. immediately, sometimes years later. He'll just be looking somewhere and all of a sudden the monkey will be on the shelf. And it's like Elf on the Shelf, but worse. This would be an awesome replacement for Elf on the Shelf. (laughs) If you a murder monkey. You can still buy these things. And parents of the world, if your kid asks for Elf on the Shelf, be like, not doing that. I've got something better. Take the monkey. Set it on the shelf around Christmas time and be like, we're doing the monkey this year. Now, here's the thing. If you hear the symbols go, something you love will die. <laughs> it, could be, it could be mommy or daddy. It could be brother or sister. Could be your favorite teacher, a dog, even just a house plant. We don't know. But it'll only bang his symbols together if you're bad. So, got to stick it out till Christmas, kids. That's my new elf on the shelf. Monkey on the... <laughs> Monkey. Psychologically tormenting your kids. <laughs> Elf on the Shelf is psychologically tormenting your kids anyway. Fair so enough. So you may as well go whole hog. Uh, <laughs> Stephen King's The Monkey. Thank you, Mr. King. Uh, you and I were talking back and forth about The Monkey, and you had said that you were you were upset, saddened, and upset that this monkey did not reappear. Or I said I was upset, and you were like, why? This monkey could defeat it. This yeah. monkey could defeat Pennywise. Like, it literally can just... <laughs> Kill you from a distance for no reason. It's the most evil thing he's ever created. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, yeah, it's a shame that it didn't show back up in the Dark Tower series like all the other villains do. Uh, and I was, and I really thought a lot about that after we talked about it. And in a way, this story is 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 a is like a proto version of it. Enough. Like it literally is. It's a it's a nested tale. It's two stories: an adult and a ch- and him as a child, retelling the story of him as a child, fighting and defeating this ancient evil that then comes back when he's an adult and that he has to get rid of again. And it's yeah. told in flashbacks as he tries to get rid of it the second time. I was like, this is this is the skeleton of it. Uh, uh, yeah. And the monkey is Pennywise. It's an evil that's killing things for no reason other than its own, like, satisfaction. And then it it gets defeated, and then it comes back, like, 30 years later. Um, Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why it works so well. But does the monkey... I can't remember. Does the monkey kill anyone in present day? I don't think it does. Not entire. I don't think so. Um, I'm going to skim through this real quick to see. I'm I'm pretty sure it does it. I think he... I think he manages to not have it go off. Yeah, it's a threat and it's almost it causes him stress and he's mm-hmm. and he's worried about it but mm, the like the the bulk of the plot takes place in his flashbacks as the as he's as he remembers things that happened to him with his encounters with the monkey as a child. Yeah. Uh but I guess I guess the idea. So the reason he finds the monkey again is when he was a kid, his 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 dad disappeared. His mother died as a result of the monkey when he was very young. Uh, mm-hmm. She had a she had an aneurysm at work, and he goes to live with his aunt and uncle, uh, who are a kindly couple, uh, even though his uncle uh, drops the n word twice. Yep. In the beginning of the story, uh, in Good such old. A- Stephen King. The old Stephen King. 1980 Stephen King. So come on, my my, my boy. Uh, the uncle drops the N-word twice. He says that the monkey looks like a blank. Yeah. The way its teeth look. It smiles like a blank. And I thought, because this happens right away, I was like, okay, I, I didn't remember this. I was like, okay, so 
this is setting the uncle up to be a jerk. This is setting the uncle up to be a racist or like in, in any story, this would be your first indication that he's about to have to go live with his, his, his racist uncle. Who's kind of a bad, Nope. Uncle is a perfectly nice guy. I guess yep. this is just King's way of saying he's just an old timer, you know, with his, with his salty language. <laughs> and I'm like, this is really uncomfortable. My friend, uh, my dude, Stephen King. Mm-hmm. Uh, my dude. I mean, but our indication that the monkey is active again is the fact that his aunt and his uncle have both died. And there is mm-hmm. some – he find, so they go to the house to, to, to clean out the house where he grew up. And he finds them – his son finds the monkey in the attic again. And so that's our – it's implied that the, the, the aunt and the uncle might have died because the monkey was coming back into power. Yeah. Uh, because it – when he was a kid, he had dropped the monkey down, down a, a well. Mm-hmm. And Which, covered it back up. Yeah. Vary the ring. Mm-hmm. Uh, except for instead of chucking your stepdaughter down a well, you chucked an oh. evil murder monkey. I thought you meant the ring from the Lord of the Rings, which is no. similar in that it always comes back. Yeah. Uh, yes. He 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 Sadako's his, his, the monkey. He eats it into a well. Yeah. Um, when he's like six, he's a little kid. Yeah. I mean... There's really no blame to place on this poor boy. No. At all. Uh, chucks it down a well, covers the well up, uh, gets torn apart by by brambles. Uh, it's very explicit in how much this kid gets sliced to pieces by the by the thorns uh, and by blackberry bushes. So there is – he says, like, it took 30 years for this thing to come back. So – there's some physical aspect of it because the monkey had to get out of the well. Now, clearly nobody helped it out, but it gets out. So there is some sort of physical limitation on this thing. It has to somehow psychically get out of the well in 30 years. I don't know how. Yeah. I don't know how. They don't explain it, which I love. I love that it's never explained. We never find out why the monkey is like this. We never find out if it's cursed, if it's a demon. Nothing. It's kept completely vague which is part of the power of this story is that it's just it's just, like christine like the overlook hotel it's just evil there's just an evil about it that makes yeah. it so cool um there is another sort of main character in this story though as well it's Petey, the little boy his the little son little boy. yeah uh um, do you wish i'd named you Petey? no is Petey a good name for a child I mean, it's not a bad one. I just like my name better. If your name is Peter, though, and people call you Petey, you're already a victim. <laughs> I don't think there's ever been a hero named Petey. There's one in this story. I guess he is kind of a I mean, he doesn't do much. No, but he also doesn't like... He, he helps. He tries to help his dad with the he evil murder for, monkey. He does. He's the only one who who his dad confides in about the monkey being a murderer. He's not going to tell his older son because his older son is a jerk and also got slammed against the wall. I remember this story ending differently, honestly. I, really? I was totally shocked. I, I'm probably conflating it with other King stories. Reverse. Um, so he gets his son. So the when he was a kid, he used to go fishing with his uncle and his uncle... At one point, his uncle's like, you know, like, we don't ever go out into this part of the lake or we we don't go straight to this part of the lake. It's the deepest part of the lake. It's super deep. Um, so he decides what he, to do is put the monkey in a duffel bag, fill the duffel bag with rocks, row out to the middle of the lake and drop the duffel bag over the deepest part of the lake. Because even though it won't stop the monkey, it'll slow it down for another 30 years or so. Uh, he rows out there. His son stays on the shore. He drops the monkey. The monkey starts banging its cymbals as it's as it's going down. And as he's rowing back to the shore, he his boat falls apart <laughs> and he thinks he's going to drown. But it finally he makes he it falls apart, but it's in the shallow area and he manages to swim, hug his son. And that's it. I remembered the short story ending with him discovering that his wife and son had his other son had died because they're out of town at this point. I thought he got like some kind of call that they had been in a car accident and my other memory was that when he when he finally gets back to the shore, his younger son, something has happened to him. Totally made up. Like, it is was, there an adaptation or something that does that? 
I think I was remembering Christine. I think because in Christine, okay. he think they think they've gotten rid of the car, but then like he finds out later that like someone has died, and you're like, oh, it's still out there. Like instead, in the short story, it's the fish. The fish all die. Yeah. Hundreds of dead fish were found floating belly up on Crystal Lake in the neighboring township of Casco last week. Yeah. Uh, Crystal Lake, by the way, being the lake from Friday the 13th. But this yep. is before Friday th- or the same year as Friday the 13th, which is funny. Like, What are the odds? Clearly, he just it's a name for a lake. It's a very innocuous sounding lake Yeah, uh, name. But uh, it's just funny that like I like to believe that they are tied together, that the monkey is constantly banging its symbols, and Jason Voorhees is. This is why Jason Voorhees is alive because the the monkey magic. Like the monkey's yeah. like, well, I can't get out myself. I can I can re re make this make this drown boy come back out of the lake though. Jason Voorhees monkey crossover when when question mark. Uh, yeah, because it kind of has a happy ending. Does it? I mean. None of his family dies. Yeah. Uh, just potentially everyone else. Considering how dark most Stephen King short stories end, though, this one's surprisingly, like, upbeat. It's like... That's true. It's just, if this is a common fishing lake, and the monkey doesn't need to be that, like, far from people, or that, like, close to people for them to die, you know? <laughs> I th- To me, I think the monkey... The rules seem to be that the monkey has to be close to someone for them for someone's like the monkey has to be close to Hal for someone Hal loves to die what if somebody goes there every week to like feed the fish and the monkey gets really close to one of the fish that they feed and then that person dies I think the first the person would have to know that fish that's why I think only fish are dying like there is one fish down there who sees the monkey and is like that thing's no good and it keeps like banging its symbols and like one of its fish friends dies like i think you have to be at least somewhat close to the victim uh someone's going to have to i don't know somehow that monkey's gonna swim out of the, it got out of the <laughs> well somehow it's gonna get out i think the monkeys i think everyone's okay for now uh yeah I also mean, i think ha- as long as no one goes to back to that house it's okay i think the monkey's only going to show back up in the attic which is interesting Right. It's an like interesting it, limitation. It on... didn't show back up at Hal's actual home. It showed because they're not even living in the house. They're staying in a hotel. Yeah. Which is a weird plot point. Like, I would think that, like, I lost my job. My aunt and uncle died. We're going to move back into the old house. But instead, it's like we're moved into a hotel and we're just cleaning out the house. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. But. Hey, the 80s, man. It was a different world where you the... could afford things. The, it's true. The, it was the, bit... the death of the dog is the death that always stuck with me because he causes the dog to have an aneurysm and the dog like stumbles and falls and like blood comes shooting out of its eyes and stuff. And as a kid, when I read this, I was like, holy crap, is that an aneurysm? <laughs> Even people in the story, though, are like, this isn't a regular aneurysm. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Happen. They're like, yeah. uh, I like the, I like their excuse of she's old. Ah, yes. You know, the the old age death of blood spurting out of your eyes <laughs> yeah you know how when your dog gets too old and its eyes explode i yeah. uh but but they even say like he knows as a kid like this is a weird death yeah but no, for I mean... some reason i didn't remember that part and so when i was a kid and i read this and by kid i mean like junior high that was what an aneurysm was to me and it terrified <laughs> me because i understood that you could die of an aneurysm without knowing you were with with no warning like and that is what happens like you can you can have an aneurysm without with no ill effects beforehand and for a long time that was my like that terrified me the thought of like dying like this because his mother dies the same way Mm -hmm. and and i just i lived in fear so thank you the monkey for instilling that fear in a young man so i have a question Mm -hmm. i have a question about the monkey's powers uh we've established that it it can it has reality warping powers do you think that um it can only warp reality to the extent of what already might have been happening. Yes. Like we don't see anyone get hit by lightning. Yeah. Or we don't see we don't see people's arms fall off or anything. Like it's a. It, yeah. That's it, why I said it's kind of like Final Destination. Like it kind of yeah. causes it kind of sets things up so you so die. Like, his babysitter was already at risk of getting shot and killed. 
the monkey right. just ensured that it happened. Right, because she gets killed in her apartment by her roommate's boyfriend. Mm-hmm. They get in an argument. The roommate's boyfriend kills both of them and then kills himself. Yeah. And that conceivably could have happened anyway. In fact, you're kind of left for a while wondering if this is all just coincidence until mm-hmm. it clearly isn't. Um, until the monkey starts you know, talking to him. Right. And he, the monkey kills a fly at one point. Mm-hmm. There's a fly buzzing in the room and the monkey accidentally like someone bumps the monkey and its symbols just go clink and the fly falls down dead. Which, so that very lucky that it was just a fly. <laughs> but that also means that like the level of death is caused by like, I guess, how many times the monkey can bang its symbols and how forcefully. Like mm-hmm. if the monkey's like clunk, 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 like maybe you'll just get a bad headache. I don't know. Um, yeah. So then. My 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 theory is that it has to cause a brain aneurysm in people whose deaths aren't fated to happen anytime soon. Right, right. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, it seems to be. It seems to have to operate under certain rules. Yeah, uh, you can't muffle the symbols. He says he tried that when he was a kid. He put a pillow between the symbols, and when he came back, the pillow was across the room. Uh, Which I yeah, I don't really know what you were expecting. Right. What and if also- he duct taped something to the symbols? I think he would just come back and it would just be undone. Like, he said that he tried to, he put his hand between the symbols at one point, or he put something between the symbols when it tried to, and he felt like a like a, like a jolt. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like if you grabbed onto him and tried to stop them from clanging, like, it would hurt you somehow. Uh, yeah. Like, there's some kind of magic around this thing that makes it inevitable. Um, which is a little bit of a cheat, but also not because it makes it really creepy. It's the it's the hedge animals in The Shining. Like they're only they only come after you when you're not looking, and the monkey only seems to use its like superpowers when you're not looking at it. It the way it travels and the way it like gets rid of a pillow when you're not looking. So I like that because it's a mm-hmm. mystery. There's no there's no maybe. It was maybe the entire time House Family was just playing Monkey on the Shelf with him. It's been his family the whole time. (laughs) It's been his wife. Yeah. Or his first, it was his uncle. It was his racist uncle. Yeah. Uh, And the rest is just coincidence. Um, Yep. But because I love this short story so much, it was always, to me, like, it always stuck with me. Like, this is the, the horror you can't escape. As we've said on this past, that's one of the best horrors is just... It's an It Follows, it's a The Ring, it's a Juan, it's a, yeah, it's just, it wasn't your fault, but now you just got to die from it. Uh, luckily, he doesn't die from it. Luckily, he doesn't. But uh, super luckily, someone else thought this was an awesome story and made a movie of it in 1980, uh, 1985, I think, called yeah. called The Devil's Gift. Um, hey, we've already established this thing's way more powerful than The Devil. <laughs> More powerful than that. It was 1984, right? Because the, this wasn't collected in in uh, in Skeleton Crew until 85. Kenneth J. Burton uh, uh, made The Devil's Gift. I can't find much information on the making of this, except for one comment on a review of it that was by someone who worked production on this movie and said that from according to what they experienced on the set the director this was a pre this was like a pre-existing screenplay that the director like directed and worked on the screenplay and according to the director they had no i kenneth burton had no idea that this was a ripoff of a stephen king short story until production was already underway Mm -hmm. and he was very upset by this uh, but it was too late to like change anything because they were already making the movie. Uh, yeah. So fortunately, nobody saw it, and it was a bad movie, and no one got sued because uh, this is just the monkey. Yep. Except there is a there is like a a, a a plot added where this woman Elmira Johnson used a Ouija board to to infest a symbol banging monkey with an evil spirit. Uh, and after that, it just kind of becomes the monkey until the end where uh, the monkey uh, kills everybody, kills yeah. the whole family. Um, the house catches fire and they all die. Uh, it's on YouTube if you want to see The Devil's Gift. It's a really bad quality. 
But that's okay because it's a really bad movie. Yeah. It is uh, so boring. And sh- it's like a, an hour, it's not even an hour and a half long. And I just, my eyes were glazing over minutes in. Um, it's just, it's a bad movie. Yeah. But what's funny is 12 years later, Kenneth J. Burton made his second movie uh, called Merlin's Shop of Mystical Wonders. Yeah. Uh, in which, in 1996, he took the monkey and edited it down to like 30 or 45 minutes and made it the second segment of a two-part anthology film about Merlin the wizard running a shop and trying to get cursed items back into his shop. So it's basically a ripoff on Friday the 13th, the series. Yeah. Uh Merlin is so the framing device is that Merlin is trying to get this monkey back in the second part and he does he successfully gets it back using of course all new footage that doesn't in any way line up with the original movie but also the story of Merlin trying to get these cursed objects back is itself being told as a story by a grandfather telling the story of Merlin trying to get these cursed items back to his grandson, a la the Princess Bride. So That's it's what a, I was going to say. <laughs> so it's a grandfather telling his son a story of Merlin the wizard having a magical shop in which there are a couple of stories of Merlin trying to get the... And the monkey is just the second one. And what's funny is the way he edits the monkey down, the devil's gift down into this segment, makes it shorter and makes it more... Like Stephen King's short story, because it cuts out all the extraneous made up garbage. It just focuses tightly on this cursed monkey. So now you watch it and you're like, well, this is definitely because if you just start watching The Devil's Gift and you're just like watching this woman in the seance and this demon, you're like, this is you wouldn't think this is Stephen King's story. But the way it's edited in The Devil's Gift or in the Merlin Shop of Mystical Wonders, which they did on Mystery Science Theater 3000. It's just a ripoff of the monkey at this point. Like, there's no way. Yeah. Fortunately, it never made any money. So Stephen King was probably just like, who cares? Like, I'm not I'm not going to, like, make this guy pay me $100,000 or whatever and, like, ruin his life. Like, Stephen King is like, ah, I'll let it go. Um, Maybe Stephen King just didn't know it existed. And now that we've made this episode, he's going to be really mad. I am sure this has been brought to his attention. Oh, definitely. But he has good lawyers. King also does this thing called Dollar Babies. Where if you're a if you're a budding filmmaker and you pay Stephen King one dollar, he will give you the 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 film rights to one of his short stories. Uh-huh. And he's been doing this for decades, and I assume he's still doing it. Uh, and that's the way a lot of a lot of actual filmmakers have gotten their start making Stephen King dollar babies. I think that's how Frank Darabont got his start. Like, who ended up making like The Mist? Like, yeah, he made a Stephen King dollar baby movie. And uh, the only rules I think are that you can't monetize it. You can't make money off of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's like a way for it was a way for filmmakers to get their foot in the door. And there is currently a dollar baby being made uh, an Indiegogo campaign of a guy making a short film of the monkey. Nice. Which I only discovered right before we started filming and I was getting my notes together and it has never come up on my searches before. But this guy uh, is making an adaptation uh, at at the monkey short on Twitter and Instagram. Like you can look, it's already been funded, but I'm looking at like, he hasn't released a trailer or anything yet. It's already filmed. He's it's just in the editing and scoring process. It, it, it looks like it could be cool. Yeah. Like I'm excited. Uh, He's got, he's got a good creative team. I mean, I'm not sitting here like just like pimping for this guy's like movie, (laughs) but I get excited when people do things like this. Yeah. Um, so at some point in the future, there's going to be a, a short film of the monkey released, and I'm curious as to how what he's going to do with it. Yeah, it will be interesting. Yeah, so thumbs thumbs up, dude. Uh, I still you, think this monkey should have reappeared in later stuff. Yes, this is too good to let go. <laughs> um, it's a great story. I just I love the monkey. Stephen King, can I please write a follow up to the monkey? Or yeah, like do a do a uh, uh, an anthology book of just different authors with their own takes on the monkey. Like, why not? I yes, mean, I guess that would, would be awesome. I guess it would mostly just be like people dying. Well, yeah, but I mean, 
oh, so much of media is just people dying. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> So, so yeah, so he writes The Monkey, it comes out, it gets published in Skeleton Crew. Um, it was actually published the same year, it counts as a, as a, as what they call a chap book, uh-huh. because, uh, because, I guess because it was a pullout, um, like, insert in the magazine, it's considered its own, like, separate publication. Yeah. But it was also published in the Modern Masters of Horror, in Year's Best Horror Stories number, number nine, uh, in Fantasy Annual number four, and this is all in, like 1981 in the anthology Horrors in 1981. Like people knew this was a solid story. Yeah. And then it comes out in Skeleton Crew. Uh, it's published in Mike Ashley's The Mammoth Book of Short Horror Novels, and because it's considered a novelette. Oh boy. It's a novelette. Uh, but it's never not been in print. Like it's still in print in Skeleton Crew. Uh, <laughs> it, it's out there so it's easy to find a copy of the monkey if you want to read it if you don't have oh, a dark descent i have read this story before i own a copy of the skeleton crew and i've read every story in there yeah i was like, wondering why this was so familiar <laughs> yeah you got that years ago right yeah yeah i got it uh, uh around when me and my mom went to um uh, duluth for the first time together skeleton crew is a fantastic collection because it has the mist uh-huh. which is Probably the greatest novella by Stephen King. One of the greatest. Has I the, love, yeah. Has The Monkey. It has Mrs. Todd's Shortcut. It has The Jaunt. Mm-hmm. It has The Raft. It has Word Processor of the Gods. Uh, it has Survivor Type, Uncle Otto's Truck, um, and Grandma, and The Reach. The Reach is the final story in Skeleton Group. So from a to z it is just a fantastic collection of short stories it doesn't have as much faff as uh as as night shift Mm -hmm. it's got it's got just just banger after banger and even the lesser stories uh uh like the man who would not shake hands which i don't consider that great uh beach world which is just kind of a fragment uh but they're still like fun reads so yeah skeleton crew we're both Stephen King fans in this in this call, right? We're both Stephen King fans, yeah. and I totally forgot that uh, that our 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 boy David G. Hartwell in The Dark Descent uh, had a thing or two to say about about the monkey because, as we know, he likes to he likes to talk about the books. Yeah. He says uh, that King often writes in the mode of psychological horror. Uh, the raft and the crate come to mind, which to me, like those are weird because those are definitely monster stories. Um, David G. Hartwell has some interesting genre definitions. He says using the forms of the story of generational haunting, so that's true. <laughs> uh, King draws on the Ray Bradbury s device of the evil toy, a moral symbol of some complexity. Shadows of the Dark, ironies of Robert Block and Richard Matheson, and the graphic depictions of EEC Comics make this one of King's most successful stories at integrating and interweaving the strands of contemporary horror. Yet in spite of its central concern with psychological horror, the story retains the characteristic moral concerns that elevate King's major work. One of King's most salient influences on the horror story is the extent to which he is synthesizing and mutating from his voluminous reading in horror the entire historical development of the field. As Dickens regenerated the Christmas ghost story, so King has accomplished a wholesale regeneration of horror traditions in the contemporary field. And yeah, we didn't talk about the fact that uh, absent the, the the presence of the monkey itself, this is a story about a man struggling with his feelings of failure, mm-hmm. uh, his feelings of failure as a father. Like, it's very King in that regard. Yeah. This is definitely a psychological story. Mm-hmm. I just don't think the horror is part of the psychology. Or it is, I mean, it could be the story of a man without the monkey present. If, if all the deaths still had, it's the story of a man haunted by... His past. And the randomness of death. Yeah, which is, I find it interesting that no one died in the modern, mm-hmm. the modern thing. Right. Um, like... Clearly, this monkey is a malevolent force, and there's no doubt about like its its authenticity in this. But at the same time, it's it's that question of is this just a kid placing the blame of unimaginable tragedy on the shoulders of an item that that is within its his reach? Right, right. Uh, because it doesn't come back until after he loses his job, <laughs> and it's kind of like the cycle is beginning again. Not 
of the monkey, if you if you eliminate the monkey from the story, it's like the cycle of his failure, the cycle of his guilt, mm-hmm. which he's then like putting onto his older son. And if you look at it that way, then like him collaborating with his younger child on getting rid of this thing from his past and like the collapsing of the boat around him, but his eventual like, then it is about a guy like letting go of his failures. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of a, like I was just talking with my therapist about this, about, about uh, the way we sort of get caught in our own. We, we were, we, we won't do things. We won't take chances because we're afraid of failing again. But life is going to continue anyway, and you're mm-hmm. going to have setbacks and bad things will happen regardless. And it's kind of like he finally takes action at the end of this book, a story, and bad things may still show up later in life, but it's not because he didn't try. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. The only thing that would change if if the monkey wasn't here, perhaps, is the death of all those fish. <laughs> but you know what? Fish die. Maybe there's pollution. Who knows? Yeah. Maybe it's maybe it's the monster from The Raft by Stephen King. <laughs> we don't know. All I'm saying is someone please write a comic book where all of these minor villains from Stephen King's short stories, The Raft, The Crate, The Monkey, all team up again in some sort of uh uh uh, uh ex- League of Extraordinary Gentlemen of Horror. <laughs> To terrorize her, because I want these villains to come back. We focus too much on Pennywise. Bring back the monkey. Bring back the evil beer. Bring back all of his. Bring back the mangler. We want these. Yes, I love the mangler. He's so good. And that's one thing I love about the story is King is so good at taking something stupid that shouldn't be terrifying and making it terrifying. Because by, by being psychologically true to his characters. And being like, you know what's not actually scary besides the way it looks? A symbol banging monkey. You know what could be terrifying if it actually started causing everyone you love to die? A symbol banging monkey. <laughs> and <laughs> by treating it legitimately, like, okay, what would have happened if this started happening and having the character being terrified, it makes it scary. Yeah. So King is so good at that. Like, he never winks at the audience. He's just like, no, this is terrifying. If this happened yeah. to you, it would be terrifying. It's a... Uh, uh, I think it was on the old We Hate Movies podcast. They would always point out, like, if X, Y, or Z happened in real life, like, if if your dog started talking to you in real life, <laughs> if Chucky started talking to you in real life, you would just throw up, poop your pants, and go into a coma. <laughs> like, because your brain would break. So yeah. <laughs> it, uh, it, that's kind of what King does. He's like, no, if this really happened, it would be terrifying. Yeah, like there's we we make fun of so many like things. Yeah, but that's because the, the the movies or the stories themselves don't take it seriously. Yeah, like it, it's it's one thing to like be like a bit like tongue in cheek about something if that's what your intention is, but when like a a serious horror film just kind of is like, haha, look at this this funky thing that we're doing. You're like, okay, then. And I think it's one of the reasons adaptations of this kind of stuff are difficult. Because when you yeah. just show a monkey on screen, if you try too hard to make it scary, then it becomes camp. But if you don't try hard enough, it's just boring. So you've got to like... you got to find that Toy Story balance. Yep. That monkey is scary. Yep. That monkey is scary. Um, yeah. Uh, thumbs up. Thumbs up. Big thumbs up to the monkey. Uh so we've accepted that the Stephen King's The Monkey is a good story, but what we don't know is if our next story is a good story. Willow, what's the next story in The Dark Descent by David G. Hartwell? Uh, Michael Bishop's Within the Walls of Tear. Or Tyre. Or Tyre? I don't know yet. I have no idea what this story is about. I have no- It's a Southern Gothic. Southern? That's all I know. Yeah. I have never read it. I don't know what to expect. I'm looking forward to it. I've don't even. I've never even read Michael Bishop, as far as I know. So we're we're in for a we're in for a uh, a, a doozy, probably a doozy. A doozy. He yeah. uh, he writes dark fantasy, apparently. Well, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, uh, thank you so much for for listening to the Dark Descent. Uh, it's Del Toro time. 
I don't think Guillermo del Toro would make an adaptation of The Monkey. It has nothing to do with anything he writes about. I mean, it might have some clockwork in it. I was just thinking that. Maybe clockwork? But that is, that's literally it. This is not his style of story. And that's fine. And that's yeah. fine. Because this is this is a, a subheading of, of It's Del Toro Time. It's Del Toro um, Time. Yep. Uh, uh, Willow and Phil read short stories. <laughs> yep. You can find us on Twitter at Del Toro Time. You can find us on Facebook at It's Del Toro Time. Uh, give us a shout. Uh, give us a listen. We're on uh, YouTube as well under Phil Gonzalez's my, my Facebook, my YouTube page. I'm loading these all onto YouTube where they're doing pretty, people are listening to them. Like I think they're not necessarily listening to the whole thing, but you know, uh, uh, they're starting up. We're getting a few, a few, a few listens. So uh, check us out there if that's the way you like to listen to things. Uh, until next time with Michael Bishop, I am Phil. And I'm Willow. And we'll see you when it's Del Toro time. Right.